You said we're going to have some constructive dialogue today, so let's have some right now, Minister, and lay it all on the table. And We're not going to talk about technical gun sides of this today. We're going to try and figure out where we are today, how we got here, and where we're going tomorrow. We stood up in the House multiple times and stated that opposition parties who were concerned with your pre planned amendments to Bill C-21 were spreading misinformation. However, on February 3rd, when you withdrew your amendments, your own government house leader stated, and I will quote, there were gaps and problems in the amendments, that's why we've retracted them, end of quote. Could you now please admit that the genuine concerns that Canadians had about these amendments were not baseless misinformation? Perfect. Minister, it's um, been a while that we've been waiting for you to come to this committee for these consultations, six weeks since we wrapped up our consultation. I know when you first introduced this bill almost a year ago, you took the position that you wanted this passed as quickly as possible. And then when it came to committee in the late fall, Liberal members on this committee were insistent that we pass this bill within a week. Now this is months later and you've made us wait six weeks for you to come here. So I do appreciate that you're here now to answer our questions. Um, you did mention in the opening remarks that a cornerstone of your legislation, Bill C-21, is to combat gun traffickers, which is something that I deeply support. This is a primary focus, should be, for fighting gun violence in this country. So you've talked about it on national television, you talked about it today, that this bill will strengthen, as your words, um, penalties for gun traffickers from their 10-year maximum sentence now to 14 years. How common is it that the current maximum of 10 years, how common is that right now since you formed government in 2015? Uh, Ms. Dancho. Is it common at all? Has it happened quite a bit? Ms. Dancho. The information that your office provided to my office is that not one person Are since you me? the Liberals formed government in 2015, not one person has been awarded the current 10-year maximum sentence. Ms. Dancho. So it is frustrating to see you talk on national television here today in question period to our questions about how you're getting tough on gun traffickers and increasing the maximum to 14 when the current 10 has never been used since uh, your Prime Minister formed government a few years ago. We all uh, witnessed the Mass Casualty Commission report come out. The report uh, seemed to echo a lot of the policies that your government has been promoting. But I would ask, Minister, in the case of the Port of Peak killer, how would a gun ban have prevented somebody who smuggled firearms and didn't have a license from possessing these firearms? And if you'll permit, Mr. Lloyd, I would hope that we all uh, join in expressing our condolences and support to the families of Porta Pick and Truro. Minister, we all grieve for and the families, but Minister, I had a direct question for you. How would a gun ban have prevented the Porta Peak killer from accessing illegally smuggled firearms without a license? How would it have prevented him from having those firearms? The short answer is that by putting in place a ban, we reduce the possibility and the likelihood of there being any of these types of firearms in our communities. And that's the difference, is that the Conservatives believe that by not having a ban, that somehow that that translates into safer communities. The Conservatives, respectfully, are fundamentally wrong Policies on that Policies that actually take crime down and take criminals down, not policies that are virtue signaling, Minister. So welcome to meeting number 62 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security. We will start by acknowledging that we are meeting on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format pursuant to the House Order of November 25th, 2021. Members are attending in person in the room and remotely using the Zoom application. So pursuant to Standing Order 108 Sub 2 and the motion adopted by the committee on Friday, February 3rd, 2023, the committee resumed its study of the effects of the withdrawn amendments G4 and G46 to Bill C-21, an act to amend certain acts and to make certain consequential amendments firearms. So we welcome today in person the Minister of Public Safety and, and high officials from various departments and agencies. First, firstly, we have the Honorable Marco Mendicino, Minister of Public Safety. Welcome, Minister. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have from the Canada Border Services Agency, uh, Mr. Daniel Anson, Director General, Intelligence and Investigations. Thank you. From the Department of Justice, Mr. Matthew Taylor, uh, General Counsel and Director, Criminal Law Policy Division. From the Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Mr. Talal Dakalbab, and I apologize for that. Um, I'm, I'm working on that. 
uh, Senior Assistant Deputy Minister, Crime Prevention Branch. And from the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, we have Mr. Brian Larkin, Deputy Commissioner, Specialized Policing Services, and Ms. Kelly Paquette, Director General, Canadian Firearms Program. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, we will start, uh, we'll note that the Minister will be with us for the first hour and remaining uh, uh, officials can, will stay for the second hour as possible. Um, so welcome to everyone. I now invite the Minister to make an opening statement. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm pleased to return to this committee to discuss Bill C-21 and the broader actions the government is taking to reduce gun violence. Ce projet de loi vise essentiel this bill aims to ensure Canadians' security. This is part of the promise that we made to Canadians to fight against violence and crimes due to firearms. And to do so, we are looking to remove firearms from the battlefield. Gun reform legislation this country has seen in a generation. It implements a national freeze on handguns, the number one type of gun used in homicides. It addresses the alarming role of firearms in domestic violence through our red and yellow flag laws. And it will raise maximum sentences against gun traffickers from 10 to 14 years. We're committed to getting this right and getting this legislation passed for all Canadians. To do that, we need to engage people. And that is exactly what we have been doing. Les chasseurs, les experts du sector. Hunters, experts, indigenous peoples, rural Canadians and Canadians from the north have been spoken with for us to be able to better understand the role that firearms play in the day to day lives of numerous Canadians who hunt to feed their families, protect themselves, and to preserve their traditions. I've met with gun owners from right across the country, and most recently in Ontario, Quebec, <coughs> Nova Scotia, Yukon, and Northwest Territories, where hunting is not only recreational, but something that is passed on from one generation to the next. And of course, Mr. Chair, I have the sober responsibility of grieving with family members and communities who've been devastated by gun violence. I have consoled families in Nova Scotia, Quebec City, Montreal, Surrey, and in my own hometown of Toronto. I've attended the funerals for 10 police officers. We owe it to them. Every member of this committee, every member of parliament, and every parliamentarian owes it to them to keep going. We just marked the third anniversary of the shooting tragedy in Portapique in Truro, Nova Scotia. I joined the Prime Minister to receive the final report of the Mass Casualty Commission and to grieve with the families. Mr. Chair, one of the recommendations to emerge from the final report called on the government to strengthen the national ban on assault-style firearms, which we put into place in 2020. And it's not just the Mass Casualty Commission. It's law enforcement, survivors and victims, and the vast majority of Canadians who support taking action against a type of firearm which, let's be clear, was designed to inflict the greatest number of fatalities in the shortest period of time. Nous devons poursuivre ce travail en mettre... We need to continue this work by implementing our global plan to prevent future tragedies. A smart political plan is just one of the methods that we're using to get rid of gun-related violence in Canada. To stop the flow of illegal guns, backed by a $450 million investment into border security in the last two years alone. Last year, the CBSA and RCMP seized a record number of illegal firearms at the border, but we need to continue that progress. Strong prevention through our investments in stopping crime and violence before it starts. And this begins with our $250 million Building Safer Communities Fund, 
a program that is designed to help set up young people who are at greatest risk for success by advancing their educations and their careers so that they can make positive contributions to our communities. Initiatives like 902 Man Up in Halifax, which I've had the pleasure of visiting with, are making an incredible difference. And they are just one of the many organizations right across the country which are benefiting from this initiative. Our National Crime Prevention Strategy and the Guns and Gangs Violence Action Fund are two more examples of how we are stopping gun crime before it starts. And finally, Mr. Chair, strong gun lines and the keystone legislation that is before you right now in the form of Bill C-21. The goal is to prevent another tragedy like what we witnessed at Ecole Polytechnique, like what we saw at Port de Pique. Canadians strongly support prohibiting assault style, style firearms and support Bill C-21. Not slogans to make sure all Canadians can feel safe at home. Striking the right balance to meet the goals I've outlined today while working with this Parliament is something that we remain committed to doing. Together, we now have both an opportunity and a responsibility to not only pass this bill in its current form, but to strengthen it. Mr. Chair, I look forward to supporting amendments that will address the assault-style rifle ban as the Mass Casualty Commission final report called on us to do, along with other priorities that deal with ghost guns and indeed the responsibilities of manufacturers to play their role in keeping our communities safe. Mr. Chair, in conclusion, Canadians are counting on us to do this work responsibly, based on facts, not fear. And I hope that all of my colleagues will contribute to a constructive dialogue today, and I now look forward to your questions. Merci. Thank you, Minister. We will start our first round of questions with Ms. Dancho. Ms. Dancho, please go ahead. Six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister and, uh, and staff for being with us today on this important matter. Minister, it's um, been a while that we've been waiting for you to come to this committee for these consultations, six weeks since we wrapped up our consultation. I know when you first introduced this bill almost a year ago, you took the position that you wanted this passed as quickly as possible. And then when it came to committee in the late fall, Liberal members on this committee were insistent that we pass this bill within a week. Now, this is months later, and you've made us wait six weeks for you to come here. So I do appreciate that you're here now to answer our questions. Um, you did mention in the opening remarks that a cornerstone of your legislation, Bill C-21, is to combat gun traffickers, which is something that I deeply support. I think law enforcement also support that. As you know, Toronto Police have said almost 9 out of 10 guns used in crimes in Toronto are smuggled from the United States. So collectively, police have told us and to you that this is a primary focus should be for fighting gun violence in this country. So I appreciate that C-21 based on your remarks, is attempting to do that. I know you've talked about it on national television. You talked about it today, that this bill will strengthen, as your words, um, penalties for gun traffickers from their 10-year maximum sentence now to 14 years. How common is it now to award or to sentence someone to 10 years, the current maximum? How common is that now? Uh, Ms. Dancho, thank you for your question. Thank you as well for outlining the work that I have been engaged with over the last six weeks, but not only then, indeed right uh, back to the start when we tabled this bill. Uh, and I have heard loudly and clearly from Canadians from every walk of life, including from uh, gun owners and First Nations communities and Canadians, mm -hmm. about what they expect out of this bill, which are smart gun laws. Right. You've, no, asked me about, you've asked me about maximum sentences. Right. I've worked on the front lines of the criminal justice system as a federal prosecutor. I will tell you that I have confidence in the judiciary to exercise good judgment right. when so it since, comes to uh, since, uh, making sure that we separate those gun traffickers from our communities when we need to do so. How common is it that the current maximum of 10 years, how common is that right now since you formed government in 2015? Uh, Ms. Dancho... Is it common at all? Does it happen quite a bit? Ms. Dancho, every single case is taken on its facts, but okay. I have confidence in the judiciary to use the higher maximum sentences to make sure that gun traffickers who terrorize our I communities with that. guns okay. are separated from the community so we can keep our communities safe. I would hope that that would be the safe. case, certainly, given how many lives are being taken, given how important it is that we tackle 
gun smuggling. I would agree with that statement you made. However, the information that your office provided to my office is that not one person since the Liberals formed government in 2015, not one person has been awarded the current 10-year maximum sentence. So it is frustrating to see you talk on national television here today in question period to our questions about how you're getting tough on gun traffickers and increasing the maximum to 14 when the current 10 has never been used since uh, your prime minister formed government a few years ago. So I just feel that that's really a non-starter and it's really not going to do a lot to combat this issue, unfortunately. So that part of C21 isn't going to make that much of an impact given the maximum of 10 years has never been used since uh, the Liberals formed government a few years ago. But I do want to move on to the red flag provisions. This is an area, to be honest, that I was looking forward to. As you'll recall, I asked that this be split from the bill so we can take the politics out of it and look to support the red flag provisions. Uh, you were in the chamber at that time. You did not allow me to split that out of there. But what we found in uh, our testimony is that the Canadian Bar Association, the National Associations of Women and the Law, which was a liberal witness, domestic violence groups from Quebec, and also three chiefs and vice chiefs that we invited to committee all uh, did not want those red flag laws provided or uh, passed in this bill. They did not support them. And they're the very groups that I would have imagined would have supported them because they were supposed to be for vulnerable groups and women of domestic violence situations. That's why I was interested in supporting them off the bat, but yet we heard firsthand that they're no good. In fact, uh, the quotes were quite damning. Um, the women's group said that it would prohibit uh, extremely quick action uh, that is essential to preventing femicide. Uh, it is likely to be risky and impractical for women whose safety is at risk. It also says it will do more harm than good for women impacted by this. And it, the Indigenous <coughs> groups mentioned that racism could play a factor, that the red flag laws could be abused. Uh, if someone just doesn't like someone in a First Nation, they can have their guns apprehended. That is the impression that your red flag laws in this bill has given the public. So those don't seem to be any good either. Um, and it's just frustrating because there's not a lot in this bill that we can really talk about because you've already passed the handgun ban through regulation in the fall. So that major keystone, as you've called it, in C21, pardon me, has already been accomplished by your government. So looking at the bill, one minute, thank you. There's not a lot in there, and yet this has been holding up the good work of this committee for quite some time. And as you know, there's about four or five inches worth of amendments and clause by clause on C21 that we still have to do. And there's only two months left, Minister. And you made us wait six weeks. You also have two other bills uh, in the chamber waiting to come to this committee, not to mention that there's been a 32 percent increase of violent crime, as you're well aware, since your government took office seven years ago. And of that crime, less than half of one percentage point is committed by long guns, and yet your government has chosen to divide Canadians with the amendments that you've recently pulled. So it's really not clear to me what C21 is going to accomplish, and reasonably, I think we can understand if you would pull this bill, and it's, I'm just wondering to conclude if that's part of your plan, Minister. Uh, well, Ms. Dancho, your time is up, but we'll allow the Minister... Yeah, I'd uh, ask for uh, some discretion from the Chair, because Ms. Dancho did speak for approximately three minutes, and there are some very important points there. I'm happy to stretch uh, out my um, um, visit to this committee uh, to accommodate uh, other members who may wish to also use their time. Uh, but first, Ms. Dancho, I fundamentally disagree. Um, there is a lot of good policy in this bill, including the national handgun freeze, which you and You've your party opposed. You've already accomplished that through regulation. Um, Ms. Dancho, the floor has... The Minister has the floor. How much time are you going to let him speak? Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I may be permitted to answer the numerous uh, substantive points, because I think, in fairness, Canadians... Ms. Dancho has raised some good questions. Canadians have a right to hear the answer from the government. I disagree. There's good policy in here including the national handgun freeze, uh, including the red flag and yellow flag laws. On balance, Mr. Chair, we've heard the concerns of a number of advocate groups. We have made some modifications to the red flag provisions uh, so that we can ensure that there is protection of those who come forward to avail themselves of another layer of protection. Um, and the last thing I just want to say with regards to sentencing provision is um, I share the concern uh, that Ms. Dancho articulates around uh, maximum sentences. By raising maximum sentences, we're sending a very strong signal to the courts 
that for those who do terrorize our communities with guns, that there should be higher sentences. And that is a far better approach than the failed Conservative Party uh, uh, policies around sentencing and mandatory minimum penalties and the overreach of the Conservative Party on MMPs, which have been systematically struck down by the Supreme Court of Canada. Thank you, Minister. On y va maintenant, Monsieur Schiffke. We'll now go to Mr. Schiffke. Go ahead for six minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister, for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Minister, for several months, you've been holding consultations on the definition of assault-style firearms. I know that it's been a lot of work. What are your main conclusions from these consultations? Um, merci pour la question, uh, Monsieur. Thank you for the question, Mr. Schiffke. Mr. Chair, my conclusion is that Canadians are very concerned by gun-related violence. And this is the reason why our government has moved forward with a comprehensive plan. So firstly, we are offering logical policy. So in 2020, we introduced a ban on assault style firearms. So we're speaking here of firearms that have been designed for the battlefield. And now we have the report from the Mass Casualty Commission. In this report, there is a recommendation to the government to strengthen this national ban that I just mentioned. So I hope that we can continue this work with this committee through an amendment. So correct me if I'm wrong, Minister, but you agree with experts as well as human rights advocates that have requested a definition for uh, assault-style weapons. Yes, I am. Historically, this classification process is done by our colleagues at the RCMP. So they have a director of firearms, and in their offices, they work on this. That being said, I do think that there could be a better process if we had a technical definition that speaks of the physical characteristics of these firearms and that this definition be made by working with the industry. Study, we heard additional testimony on ensuring manufacturers are regulated to prevent them from exploiting loopholes, which we've seen happen uh, in Canada's firearm classification system. I know this was an issue that the Danforth families brought up. Uh, their testimony was quite powerful uh, in their exchange with our committee. Could you talk a little bit about the role that manufacturers play and shifting the onus onto them to ensure that they are compliant with the intent of our firearms laws? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, first, I, I do want to give a shout out to uh, not only Danforth families, but Polly Sisuvien, uh, the Women's Coalition, and so many other groups with whom uh, we have been working very closely with. And these are um, people who have been uh, profoundly and tragically impacted as a result of gun violence. It is thanks to them and their advocacy that we are in, uh, I think, a position to not only pass this strong legislation, but to take even ad uh, further additional steps, including around the question of how it is that we classify prohibited firearms specifically on the question of assault style firearms. And this is where I believe that with uh, the work of this committee that we can look at an amendment that would see a technical definition uh, that would allow us to pick up and answer the call of the Mass Casualty Commission. And so there is work to be done here uh, and I look forward to doing that work with all parliamentarians. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you, Minister. Last question. Several police associations in Quebec recently stated that they would support an assault uh, firearm ban. Minister, how important are these concerns for you, the concerns of police officers? Je suis vraiment préoccupé. 
I'm extremely concerned. Like I mentioned in my opening remarks, I have witnessed 10 funerals. 10. This is never seen before. And it's been extremely hard times for the police community. And I would even say for all Canadians. So I would like to thank Quebec's police associations. They are not the only associations that have shared their support for what we're doing here and that are calling upon us to go further on in our work with firearms. And I think that we have the opportunity and the responsibility to answer the call of Nova Scotia's commission. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Shifke. Thank you, Mr. Shifke. We will now go to Ms. Michaud for six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister, for being here today. Very much appreciated. I'll be very honest with you. I'm disappointed. I expected that you were going to announce new amendments for our clause by clause study of C21. There has been a, a study on amendments G4 and G46. I know that you have been back to the uh, the drawing board and you have consulted with uh, Indigenous communities as well as hunters. What I would like to know is what solutions have you found to draw a clear line between military style firearms and those firearms that are used in reasonable circumstances for hunting? We do need to begin our clause by clause study here very soon. And I know that you had promised new amendments for us before we began our clause by clause. And these are, uh, we do not see these here today. Yes, you are correct. I have consulted with Canadians as well as experts that work for the RCMP. And we have worked on the issue of this definition. Firstly, the OIC 2020 established characteristics. A 10,000 joules uh, force. Donc, si un arme à feu excédé. So, if a firearm goes beyond these aforementioned characteristics, it would be uh, prohibited. Now, we also have these physical characteristics that have been discussed in the original amendments, I think that we could still take another look at these technical characteristics. And I am still ready to work with you and the entire committee. So you're happy to work with the opposition to table amendments, but are you ready to table these set amendments? That is exactly what we're doing with you and with the entire community committee rather at the beginning of your speech minister you said that c21 was the strongest gun reform if i take a look at c21 in its current form we don't talk about illegal gun trafficking we want to create exemptions in certain cases on the handguns fr freeze in and right now there are no amendments that ban assault style uh, firearms well miss michaud i think that we've done we've gotten further than we ever have in terms of the uh, firearms freeze on handguns. This is something that we've never seen before in the history of the country. That's one positive example. Now, you're right. There are concerns on the topic of our red and yellow flag measures. But I think that we have responded to a certain number of these concerns. In terms of gun trafficking, we have more 
severe sentences, and we have new techniques that we want to off offer to the police service, such as wiretaps. Thank you, Minister. One of the arguments against G4 and G46 is that they were unclear and caused confusion. We spoke of different lists of uh, firearms that are banned or exempted, but it seems that we should be able to have a clear definition of a military style firearm. And we need to think of not only firearms that are on the market, but will come into the market in the future. Now, from a legislative standpoint, are we able to create a definition without using a list that in any case wouldn't be updated in the criminal code, as far as I'm aware, the only uh, list that would be updated would be with the RCMP. So you've had these consultations. Were you able to come up with a new definition of a military military style firearm? The answer is yes. I have received a lot of feedback on this issue. There are numerous concerns. It's very technical. But I think that the best way that we can move forward with a strong policy without a list is with a technical definition and with your support and by collaborating with other members of the committee, I think that we can achieve this. And in this definition, would you agree with me in saying that including a hunting firearm in the French version, fusil de chasse, could create confusion because we're telling people that their hunting firearms won't be included, but then we use this terminology. Could this lead to confusion? Yes, absolutely. That is one of the concerns that has been shared. So in English, we speak of a hunting gun. It is controversial. I do think that in certain languages, we can be cl more clear in in, with the terminology in order to be respectful towards Canadians. Mr. Julian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Mendicino, for being here with us today. Like Ms. Michaud just said, it's very important that you are here with us today, and these discussions are important because we are taking a look at the amendment process for Bill C-21. So unfortunately, we were not successful with the first version, and it was withdrawn. One of the important aspects that you mentioned in your presentation was the question of manufacturers, because I know that you're aware of this. Some organizations have stated that there are loopholes for manufacturers. We have these military-style firearms, and uh, we had a process that seemed logical and that was mandatory for these manufacturers putting out new models. And sometimes their goal here is to bypass the law. Manufacturers have an important responsibility. Can you speak to us of the current process and what could be tightened, we could say, in order to get rid of these loopholes? Thank you for the question. I think you have raised an important point. This is the responsibility of gun manufacturers. Firstly, I think that we need to find a way to help manufacturers play a role in this firearms classification. And this includes for assault style firearms. We can do this, Mr. Julian, is um by engaging directly with manufacturers to make sure that they understand that there is a responsibility to submit firearms for classification. And by doing that, we can move away from um, the 
obligation being on not only law enforcement, but on gun owners themselves. And uh, I think that there is an opportunity to look at an amendment that will strengthen Bill C-21 so that manufacturers um, are required uh, to work with law enforcement in the classification of firearms, including on the important point of those firearms which may fall uh, under a definition of a prohibited firearm as an assault style firearm. Uh, I, you also touched in your, your statement about the issue of ghost guns. Now, we have seen uh, anecdotally, and uh, certainly I've been speaking with law enforcement as uh, the new kid on the block here at Public Safety, and uh, law enforcement have raised broad concerns about the increasing, dramatic increase in some sectors across the country of the number of ghost guns, untraceable weapons that are being produced. And uh, one, uh, in one of the meetings, uh, law, en law enforcement officers said, you know, we walk into a basement, uh, there is a 3D printer legally obtained, there are firearms components legally obtained, there's uh, ammunition on the, present, uh, on, the, on the premises as well, and that person does not have a PAL, uh, hasn't gone through a process, and yet uh, all of these aspects are legal until the, the untraceable firearm is produced. And so to what extent is this a problem? We feel very strongly in, in this corner of this committee room that uh, we have to be tackling ghost guns in a very proactive way. Uh, do you see it as a problem? Do you have the statistics there? And do you feel this is something that needs to be addressed? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank you, Mr. Julian, for uh, raising this as well. Uh, ghost guns are the next generation of guns which are being used by criminals expressly for criminal purposes. There is no legitimate or lawful um, purpose uh, for a ghost gun, other than it is designed to evade the long arm of the law, because they're easily discarded and extremely difficult, if not impossible, to, to trace. Therefore, I commend uh, any work uh, which you or any other members of this committee uh, may wish to bring forward in the form of an amendment that will help us take additional concrete steps uh, to uh, make ghost gun technology for guns illegal, uh, either through uh, the constituent parts or through other avenues. And on the last point, I know that uh, there have been questions raised about um, investigations uh, that, that may be carried out where officers um, seize upon ghost gun technology or ghost guns themselves in conjunction uh, with ammunition, which could then be used in a ghost gun. Uh, I can assure you that uh, having looked very closely at the criminal code and um, dusting off my federal prosecutor's hat, there are provisions under the criminal code that do deal with that scenario. Um, but that shouldn't in any way uh, detract from our opportunity and our responsibility. Uh, to deal with the question of ghost guns, and I encourage the committee uh, to think about that in the coming days uh, when you get to uh, uh, the amendments and clause by clause stages. Thank you. Fifteen seconds. Okay. Uh, a quick question. Uh, one of the problems with the amendments that were brought forward before Christmas uh, was that there was no consultation with organizations representing Indigenous peoples. To what extent have you been consulting over the course of the last few months? Uh, briefly, Mr. Chair, extensively, uh, we've engaged with national Indigenous organizations, we've engaged uh, with rights holders and communities. I've mentioned some, um, and I'm happy to elaborate that uh, on that work uh, later on in my appearance. Thank you, Mr. Julian. That brings the first round to a close. We'll start the second round with uh, Mr. Shipley. Please go ahead, five minutes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for being here today with us. I liked in your opening remarks, you said we're going to have some constructive dialogue today. So let's have some right now, Minister, and lay it all on the table. And we're not going to talk about technical gun sides of this today. We're going to try and figure out where we are today, how we got here, and where we're going tomorrow. So, Minister, you stood up in the House multiple times and stated that opposition parties who were concerned with your pre planned amendments to Bill C-21 were spreading misinformation. However, on February 3rd, when you withdrew your amendments, your own government House leader stated, and I will quote, there were gaps and problems in the amendments, that's why we've retracted them, end of quote. Could you now please admit that the genuine concerns that Canadians had about these amendments were not baseless misinformation? Mr. Shipley, I have zero regrets about advancing um, smart, effective gun policy. And I've heard uh, loud and clearly from Canadians 
uh, that it's important that we continue on um, putting in place the types of policies that will protect communities from assault-style firearms. And this is not abstract, and you know this, Mr. Shipley, because you and I have spoken about this. But those assault-style firearms have visited upon communities in Nova Scotia and Quebec and elsewhere the most indescribably difficult consequences and losses and tragedies. And that is why the Mass Casualty Commission has called on the government to strengthen our gun laws when it comes to assault-style firearms. And that is why I'm prepared to work with you and every other party and every other parliamentarian so that we can protect Canadians. That is the opportunity and the responsibility that we have now. And Mr. Shipley, I hope that we can do that work together. We certainly can. But Minister, again, we said we were going to have constructive dialogue. I didn't once bring up a model or, a, or, or a, a type of firearm. I'm not talking about that today. I'm trying to figure out how we got here and how much you know, we were told about this misinformation. And I think we can all agree maybe there wasn't uh, quite as much misinformation as people were being led to believe. There was some facts in people's concerns. So we heard from many different groups um, that there was not enough consultation done before these amendments were brought out. I found it very interesting that once the amendments came out and there was a bit of an uproar, not a bit, a large uproar over them, that uh, the, the amendments were introduced in November 2022. In January 2023, you took it upon yourself, and I saw your social media, you took a large tour across Canada. You called that a consultation tour. I find it interesting that the tour was taken after the amendments were taken out. I'd just like to know, was this really a consultation tour or was this a sales and promotion tour? Mr. Sh uh, Shipley, uh, let's, if you want this to be constructive, let's not be cynical. I was doing consultations before and after the amendments, and the fact of the matter is this. At the end of the day, the two visions that we have before us right now is about putting in place gun laws that will see um, fewer and ideally no assault-style firearms which were designed for a battlefield in our communities versus the policies that have been advanced by you and the Conservative Party of Canada, which would make them legal again. We think that's wrong. We think we think that's wrong. Absolute BS. You can we uh, point of order? Uh, can we uh, let the minister speak? It, well, he speaks the truth. Sure. Mr. Uh, Moss, you're out of order. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Minister. I have nothing to add to that answer. Thank you. Hope, thank you. Hope I have just a little bit more time. Thank you, Minister. I have one more question for you, sir. Um, you mentioned about the consultations you were doing, and I'll take it your word for that. Um, in, in February, though, multiple sources spoke to the Toronto Star about your approach to Bill C-21, relaying that, and I will quote, as the amendments landed, Mendicino was testifying before the Public Order Inquiry Commission and the usual normal briefings and communications plans that would have been attached to such a legislative move fell by the wayside. End of quote. Minister, you are the minister. You're the top guy of social, of the uh, safety here. Were you going to say social media? Because that's No, that's not. True. I'm the last one to mention social media. Do you take responsibility for the disaster Bill C-21 has been? Mr. Shipley, um, we have an opportunity now to take a good bill and make it even stronger. And I take umbrage... Uh, to some of the comments that were not made on the record by your colleague, Mr. Motts, um, it is very clear. The Conservatives have said repeatedly that they would repeal legislation that this government has put into place, including Bill C-71, including Bill C-21, when hopefully it passes and becomes law. And the consequence of that is that we will have weaker, not stronger legislation when it comes to keeping assault-style firearms out of our streets out of our communities. Mr. Chair, that is why the Mass Casualty Commission has called on this government to, uh, to make sure that we take those next concrete steps to keep those guns which were designed for a battlefield out of our communities. Thank you, Mr. Shipley. We go now to Mr. New Mohammed. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister and uh, officials for being here with us today. Uh, Minister, we've heard now from our colleagues about your your travels, they are clearly more cynical than some of us about what you heard. Perhaps you could take a brief moment to actually share with us what you heard, how it's shaped your thinking in terms of the path forward, uh, particularly on two things. One, whether there's a need for a technical de definition of what an assault-style firearm is. And number two, if you were to meet Grandpa Joe today, 
What would you say to him to reassure him that, in fact, you are not going after his hunting rifle? Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Nir Mohammed. I've always liked that reference because I actually do have a Grandpa Joe. There's a Nono Joe in our family. Um, but I, I would say to them uh, that we respect them. Uh, and I have met many uh, hunters and gun owners. And this is where I think the disinformation has uh, led to a toxic debate. What we want is a constructive debate that is based on the facts. And the facts are that there are guns uh, that were designed for a battlefield. And this government has taken historic steps by introducing an order in council in 2020 that rely on objective characteristics like the 20 millimeter bore diameter and 10,000 joule threshold. Those are, those are physical characteristics which now provide clarity and predictability in the classification of makes and models uh, by our colleagues in, in the enforcement uh, community. The Mass Casualty Commission uh, which was born out of the worst shooting tragedy in the history of this country, has called on the government to look at this issue and to take additional steps to strengthen our laws when it comes to assault-style firearms. And I think there can be a responsible discussion on what those uh, physical characteristics look like so that we can be clear, consistent, and upfront with all Canadians on how we do this work. Well, I think there's a lot we've heard. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of information we've heard. There has been some confusion. I think we would all acknowledge there were some challenges. There was some confusion, but I want to just take a minute for you to differentiate for us the difference between some of the confusion that may have been caused by circumstance uh, in terms of the amendments and some of the misinformation that you have referred to that was spread by some by forces and folks that did not think that we should go down this road. If you could take a minute briefly to differentiate between the two, I think that would be very valuable for this committee. And then I'd like to go back to the question about Grandpa Joe. And how do we reassure people like him that you are, you are in fact interested in something very, very different than taking away his hunting rifle? Well, let me start at the end. And if we've got time, I'll come back to the, the first uh, part of your question, Mr. Nur Mohammed, because I, I think the latter is, is very important. Um, as part of this work, it is extremely important that we talk to Canadians and that we listen to them. And people come from many different walks of life when it comes to, um, you know, the responsible use of firearms. We have hunters and sports shooters, uh, communities uh, within First Nations um, and Indigenous communities. Um, we have listened very carefully to them. And to be perfectly honest with you, uh, the majority understand what the what what it is that the government is uh, striving to achieve here which are safer communities including uh, from guns that were uh, designed for a wartime and have no recreational purpose so as I think going forward that if we anchor this debate in facts if we have a discussion that is civil if uh, we do not resort to disinformation the kind of disinformation that crowds out anybody, not only in spaces like this, but online. Um, it is next to impossible to have a conversation or a debate about firearms legislation online. And that is because of the, of the toxicity that is being driven by special interests who have no desire to, uh, to have a responsible debate, but rather you know, see this as a binary choice. Uh, between having responsible laws that protect Canadians from uh, gun violence and no laws or virtually no laws at all. And, and I think that, that that is one of the most important um, reflections that we as parliamentarians have to uh, continue to use to inform the way that we do this work. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nur Mohammed. You have 12 seconds left, but I'm going to take it back. <laughs> Um, we go now to, uh, on y va maintenant Madame Michaud. We're now going to Ms. Michaud. Two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Minister, I would like to ask you a question on your intentions on a more technical part of the bill, that being high-capacity magazines. The law has implemented an offense for modifying the capacity of a magazine. So we're speaking of magazines that could be 
where we could add more than five rounds to them and then they become prohibited. So I'd like to know what, um, or in this case, we know that the maximum is five rounds. And then for handguns, it is 10 rounds. Now, there are some loopholes that exist. There are magazines that have been created to be able to handle, say, uh, over, over five rounds, and then some stop at five. There's a limit. And what we need to note is that it's really easy to modify these magazines so that there's no limit on them. And I realize that what we're doing here is so important to prevent the types of shootings that we have seen in this country. But if we ban firearms that have a capacity of five to six rounds, I feel like we're missing the target. So are you looking to introduce an amendment that would ban firearms that ha go beyond this capacity in a permanent manner? Mr. Chair, I think that Ms. Michaud has brought to light two important things. Firstly, there is a disposition that is already in C-21 that will create so a disposition on these magazines being modified in order to increase their capacity. This is a good disposition that we can find in Bill C-21. So there's the direct response to your question. But what we also have to look at is what we can do as a federal government on this topic. Currently, we are studying the issue. In the short term, I think that there are other things that we can do to deal with the question of high capacity magazines. Thank you. 10 seconds. We will now go to Mr. Julien. Two and a half minutes, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. When I want to come back to the issue of Indigenous rights. Uh, uh, indigenous organizations took a strong stand against the amendments that were offered. You did say that you've been uh, doing consultations, the ministry has been doing consultations with Indigenous organizations. I, I would like to know the character of those consultations and also uh, what are the recommendations in terms of ensuring that Indigenous peoples, uh, their traditional rights, Section 35 rights, are preserved through this bill. I want to thank you, Mr. Julian, for the question. Um, we have, as I said at the outset of my last res uh, response to you, engaged directly with uh, NIOs as well as with other communities and rights holders directly. Um, the character of those conversations have been, uh, I think, very focused and constructive in, in relation to the questions that have been raised vis-a-vis um, -vis Bill C-21 and more specifically uh, around uh, some of the uh, amendments which were originally introduced. Um, I would say that um, both as a matter of ensuring that the lived experiences of First Nations are reflected in this bill in the practical sense as it, when it comes to food security, uh, when it comes to self-protection, when it comes to the preservation of traditions which are very much rooted in Indigenous language, uh, culture and history, I can assure you that um, those conversations have been meaningful and that um, our commitment is uh, that this bill uh, will in no way derogate from Indigenous rights as they are captured under the Charter or anywhere else. So that to me I think is an important principle and by the way it is not just with regards to C21. When we think about the work that we are doing under the United Nations Declarations Act and the work that my colleague Minister Lametti is taking, undertaking um, in the implementation of that act, um, it is very important uh, that we do this work in a way that is respectful of Indigenous peoples. Uh, we used to have the Canadian Firearms Advisory Committee, it used to have uh, the participation of Indigenous peoples. Uh, that committee is uh, dormant, uh, dead. Uh, 
is that one of the recommendations that has come back from your discussions, your consultations with Indigenous organizations of Indigenous peoples? I would say that the idea of um, re-establishing an advisory committee that can provide nonpartisan advice to the government is a concept that has been broadly raised, and I, I support it. I think that there is utility in having um, a dedicated group of Canadians from different walks of life, including uh, with Indigenous perspectives, um, so that we can um, navigate uh, the questions that this committee has been uh, undertaking in its study. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Julian. Um, uh, very, very, very fast. The imploring you, you said lands. it was a record number of seized weapons, illegal weapons coming across the border. What was that number last year? I'm going to uh, defer uh, to my uh, colleagues on this. My best recollection off the top of my hat head was that it was north of 1,000, uh, probably in the range of, um, let me see here, 1,100 is the number there that I've, that I've got here in front of me. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going now to Mr. Lloyd. Uh, go thank ahead, you, please. Mr. Chair. Uh, five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister, for coming. Um, we all uh, witnessed the Mass Casualty Commission report come out, and the report uh, seemed to echo a lot of the policies that your government has been promoting. But I would ask, Minister, in the case of the Porta Peak killer, how would a gun ban have prevented? somebody who smuggled firearms and didn't have a license from possessing these firearms? Well, I'm glad you raised the question. I think it allows me to explain the rationale of our policy. But before I do that, and if you'll permit, Mr. Lloyd, I would hope that we all uh, join in expressing our condolences and support to the families of Porta Pick and Truro, some of whom I have met with, including uh, people like Nick Beaton, who lost his wife, who was pregnant at the time. Minister, we all grieve for and the families, but Minister, I had a direct question for you. How would a gun ban have prevented the Porta Peak killer from accessing illegally smuggled firearms without a license? How would it have prevented him from having those firearms? The short answer is that by putting in place a ban, we reduce the possibility and the likelihood of there being any of these types of firearms in our communities. And that's the difference, is that the Conservatives believe that by not having a ban, that somehow that that translates into safer communities. The Conservatives, respectfully, are fundamentally wrong Policies on that Policies that actually take crime down and take criminals down, not policies that are virtue signaling, Minister. Given that the killer was in possession of illegal firearms without a license. I mean, how could a ban, if they're not being enforced, if the police who knew that the Porta Peak killer had access to illegal firearms weren't acting, how would a ban do anything to prevent criminals from accessing the firearms? There's currently bans uh, from criminals possessing firearms in this country without a license as it is, and yet they continue to access firearms. Bans don't seem to be working, Minister. How do you think this new so-called ban on so-called assault-style firearms is going to be any different? Mr. Lloyd, and if I may, Mr. Chair, I think it's quite revealing. Uh, the two points that I would say in response is, one, Mr. Lloyd, uh, you refer to other practical steps. Um, we put $450 million into the CBSA into border security. Your party voted against those provisions. I've seen that technology at work. You're hearing about the progress of seizing illegal guns. But the other thing, Mr. Chair, is calling a national ban on assault-style firearms virtue signaling completely misses the mark and is disrespectful to every Canadian who has lost a loved one as a result of those firearms. Mr. What is disrespectful to Canadians is putting forward divisive political policies that are only designed to help the Liberal Party win elections instead of policies that will actually combat violent crime in our communities. That is what is disrespectful to victims. Canadians, especially gun-owning Canadians, are committed to supporting any legislation that will have a positive impact on reducing violence and gun crime in our streets. Legal gun owners in this country have a vested interest in ensuring that our streets are safe because every time a gun crime is committed by a criminal in this country, it draws into suspicion the millions of legal firearms owners who have hunted peaceably, who have used their firearms peaceably from generation to generation. And yet every time a criminal commits a vile act, these millions of hunters, 
These millions of gun owners are demonized by your government. You have spoken of these nebulous special interest groups and their desire to have no laws whatsoever in this country. That is the kind of political rhetoric that gets in the way of us being able to have a responsible debate. There is no one serious in this country who is saying that we should have no firearms laws. There is no one serious in this country who is saying that we need to have a Second Amendment style American laws in this country. That is not the political consensus that Canadians expect, and yet we are led to believe by your government that these are real debates that are happening. These are not real debates that are happening. What the real debates one that minute. need to happen, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, the truth of the matter is um, that it's not just this government who supports a national assault-style firearm ban and taking additional step. It's the Mass Casualty Commission. It's law enforcement, as you heard earlier from Mr. Shifke. It's uh, Canadians who've lost loved ones. And indeed, it is the vast majority of Canadians. And that is what I have heard consistently. It's also uh, from responsible gun owners with whom I have engaged with. Well, that's not what we heard from groups like the Edmonton Police Association, not from what we heard from the National Police Federation, who are saying that these uh, so-called assault-style firearm bans uh, are only going to divert resources away from the real action that is needed to get criminals off of our streets. And that is the action that we as Conservatives are committed to implementing so that we can ensure that these repeat violent offenders that seem to be getting out of jail in record numbers under your leadership Minister, under your leadership, these criminals are getting back out on the street faster than ever in order to commit violent crimes over and over and over again. We need to stop the re-victimization of Canadians by liberal revolving door justice policies. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. The minister may answer. Well, if, if that were true, then I would certainly hope the next time the government puts an appropriation and a support for law enforcement at our borders and in our communities and for preventing crime, providing additional mental health supports, that the Conservatives will support it. But the fact of the matter is, historically to date, they have not. Thank you. Uh, we go now to Mr. Chang. Mr. Chang, go ahead, please. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Minister, thank you for attending our uh, committee and thank you to all the witnesses that are here. In your opening remarks, you mentioned that gun violence is a complex problem which requires a multitude of solutions. And of course, you're right about that. And it affects, gun violence affects my community of Markham Unionville directly where there have been numerous uh, home invasion, carjacking with firearms. And can you tell this committee more about the work our government is doing to keep young people safe, preventing crime before it begins, and building safer communities for all. Um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to my colleague, Mr. Chang, first, I, I want to thank you for your record of service as a police officer in keeping your community safe. And it was in your community in Markham where we launched the Building Safer Communities Fund. This is a $250 million fund, which is going to give uh, local organizations, people you know, who work on the ground, the volunteers, the community leaders, the people who know uh, those young uh, kids who are at greatest risk of being exposed to gun violence and who work with them uh, you know, day in and day out. We made a similar announcement just last week in Surrey, British Columbia. Um, it's the local heroes who are, who are doing the life-saving work. We want to give them more support. And that's what the Building Safer Communities Fund does, is it, it taps into their, uh, their expertise, it taps into their wisdom, and whether that's through the manifestation of more mental health supports or more um, educational and career training, by providing uh, that additional capacity, I believe we're saving lives. And this is another important pillar of our comprehensive strategy, which is to stop gun crime before it starts. And that is exactly what we are doing through the rollout of the Building Safer Communities Fund. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I'm going to pass my time to my colleague, Kikwinder. Mr. Gahir, go ahead. Uh, three minutes. Great. Thank you, Chair. And thank you to the minister and all the witnesses for appearing before the committee. Uh, minister, my question is that, so you acknowledge that no one initiative can tackle gun violence alone. Can you talk more about the pillars of the government's gun violence prevention plan? And specifically, what programs did you inherit? Um, what investments had to be made after a decade of conservative cuts to the RCMP and CBSA that made Canadians less safe? Well, over the last number of years, we have invested uh, close to a billion dollars 
to support law enforcement through the Anti-Guns and Gangs Fund, through our investments into the Canada Border Services Agencies. What does this mean in simple language? This means uh, more resources on the ground. It means more personnel. It means state-of-the-art technology. It means uh, making sure that um, we're you know, stopping the illegal flow of guns into our country. As you heard uh, me uh, cite the numbers, 1,100 illegal firearms seized in 2022. Uh, there have been great strides, uh, but the fact is, is that we have to do more. And, and supporting law enforcement is one pillar, but we also need to do the prevention work, as I said uh, in my response to uh, Mr. Chang. Um, prevention is a, is, is a pillar that often gets overlooked and does not get the same um, oxygen and coverage as, let's say, you know, legislation like Bill C-21 does. But it is a game changer. It is a game changing pillar. Uh, and what I would uh, say to you is that beyond the scope of this portfolio in, in public safety, the work that our government is doing through the creation of a national housing strategy to provide access to Canadians who are trying to get um, into their first home, uh, by providing more supports for mental health uh, that my colleague Minister Bennett is leading and shepherding in historic ways, are part of the way in which we can prevent crime because it gets right to the, those social determinants, those barriers that stand in the way of people who are at risk from achieving their full potential and potential giving back. And so I strongly encourage the members of this committee and all parliamentarians in their study of how it is that we can solve the, um, how, how we can solve the, the, the very, very difficult problem of gun crime to also give equal focus and emphasis to addressing prevention. And that we are doing both in my portfolio at Public Safety but equally right across government. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Gear. Uh, that brings our second round to a close. I'd like to thank the Minister for your attendance here today. Thank you, and for all of your great information. And um, we will now suspend and, uh, uh, um, and prepare for our next panel. So thank you once again. Suspended. Thank you for the officials who, who are, are remaining. Um, and um, I don't believe there are statements by the officials, so we're open to questions. We will start with uh, Mr. Lloyd, please. Six minutes. I'm, I'm, just let me preface, we can go till 10 to 6. I'm not sure how long we want to go, but uh, it's going to be up to the committee. Um, we may have to shorten the second round you know, to, to meet that deadline. But anyway, go ahead, Mr. Lloyd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for coming to all of the witnesses. Um, I'm going to start with Deputy Commissioner Brian Larkin. Uh, we had the pleasure uh, across party lines of touring the RCMP lab here in Ottawa recently, hosted by yourself and others. And at that lab, your staff told me that they already extensively work with manufacturers uh, to determine uh, they work with manufacturers uh, when working on what firearms will come into Canada. Is that the case? Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Lloyd. Uh, that is the case. We do work extensively with manufacturers, uh, but the Canadian Firearms Program also does a fair bit of research independent of the manufacturers. There seems to be an assertion that's being made that manufacturers are uh, deliberately exploiting some nebulous loopholes in order to uh, import uh, and distribute firearms in Canada. Um, can manufacturers legally import and distribute firearms in Canada without the approval of the RCMP and, and classification? Sorry, if you allow me, uh, Mr. Chair, to support my colleague on this question. So the way it functions right now is, and I don't want to say it if it's a loop or not, I'll, I'll just explain the process. If the gun that is manufactured in Canada is non-restricted, and deemed to be non-restricted by the manufacturer, they don't require to verify with the RCMP to verify the classification itself. So it is sold as non-restricted. What we heard from stakeholders is in some instances, uh, these non-restricted due to the complex classification could be actually restricted 
uh, but it's sold in the market, and by the time the RCMP gets it, measure it, it's a very detailed process, as you probably saw uh, when you, you had your visit. Has this happened? I don't have the numbers. I don't know. I'll refer to the RCMP. I just wanted to explain the process of the gap. I actually don't have um, the numbers um, of how often this has happened, but I can say that in the la since 2020, we have seen a significant increase of records that, or firearms in the industry that have not um, received um, an FRT number. And in, in doing that, um, can I back up a little bit to give a little bit of an explanation around verifiers? Well, uh, you know, no, it seems it to me, means I do have limited time, but it seems to me that a manufacturer wouldn't want to be liable by importing uh, a restricted firearm and saying it's a non-restricted firearm. Wouldn't the manufacturer be liable if they were importing firearms that were explicitly restricted or prohibited firearms, claiming that they're non-restricted? So businesses and... and most of them are verifiers, and they do use the criminal code um, to identify the classification of firearms. What, where the problem comes is in is there's varying degrees of regulations that have now been put in place um, that the businesses may not be aware of. So when they deem a firearm to be non-restricted because of the barrel length or um, they don't recognize that uh, there's another OIC or there's a regulation. Now, now this is all very interesting from a technical, but what we're here to determine is how can we make our streets safer? Is there any evidence that these firearms that maybe are somewhat vague in their classification that have come to Canada, are these being used in crimes? Do you have any evidence that, that these firearms have been, like that this is being exploited by criminals to bring these firearms into Canada for criminal use? those stats. Okay. Um, my next question, um, we've set this, uh, the uh, original amendment set that the muzzle velocity over 10,000 would be a, a new definition standard for um, an illegal firearm uh, that would be automatically banned by the definition. Now, this would include a very small amount of firearms, uh, many of which are very expensive antique firearms used for hunting big game. In fact, the cost of ammunition for such a firearm is in the hundreds of dollars for a single box of ammunition. Do you have any evidence that these particular firearms that have been used for hunting purposes have been used to commit crimes in Canada that would justify their inclusion on this list? Mr. Chair, through you, we don't have any evidence. Uh, we do not have that information. Okay. so. It's interesting. So it seems like it's not actually an objective decision based on evidence that this is a threat to public safety, that this is causing uh, fatalities, or this is being used by crime. It seems like the decision to include this specific uh, uh, cl classification in the definition is purely based on subjective values on we do not believe these firearms should be in Canada, but we don't have any objective evidence that they actually have posed a threat to Canadians. Um, in terms of airsoft, it was also very interesting. I know I only have a little bit of time. It's not most varieties of airsoft guns cannot really be converted into real firearms. Is that correct? Like the vast majority of airsoft guns, it would be very prohibitive for anyone to convert those into a real firearm. Is that correct? There is a capacity, and especially when we talk about ghost guns, uh, about using some components to use the uh, airsoft. But also for the airsoft, just to be clear, uh, what we heard from stakeholders is the concern as well from the police officers, because when they are identical... Perhaps a ban on certain components rather than trying to ban an entire sport uh, would be a better, a better path forward uh, to preventing this very, very rare occurrence from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. I'd like to remind all members that the, uh, our witnesses are here today in a non-partisan, non-political um, manner and they can't make they can't give opinions about things um, beyond that they can't uh, um, they're not here to defend government policy but to explain it if I uh, I, I believe that would be the case anyway we go now to uh, uh, we go to mr. Nu Muhammad please six minutes uh, thank you mr. chair and thank you all for continuing to be here 
uh, with us today. I'm sure this is exactly how you want to be spending your afternoon. But we are very glad you are here with us. Um, if I could start with uh, you, Deputy Commissioner Larkin. Um, you have spent a lot of time in law enforcement. You've been a local chief of police. Um, we've heard from all manner of organizations who have a ver varying degree of perspectives. One of the things that I think is really important for us to understand uh, as you continue your career in law enforcement now at the national level, when we talk about a technical definition of an assault style firearm, why is that important? What, are the, what, what value does that actually bring to the conversation and to the way in which we think about uh, keeping Canadians safe? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the question, and uh, thank you for aging me. Um, but um, on a serious note, you know, the technical specifications allow our, our regime, our Canadian Firearms Program, to actually monitor and manage uh, and license, uh, including, you know, monitoring, importing, exporting, et cetera. And so it also provides frontline police officers the ability when they're doing investigations to do those investigations to ensure that they have the facts and issues around prosecution, around the laying of charges. And so uh, without, you know, specific, uh, you know, technical specifications, without a form of regulation and a framework of, of managing uh, the specifications of firearms, it would be difficult for them to pursue uh, various investigations which meet the current threshold in the Criminal Code of Canada. And so, again, you know, our firearms program is a, a unique licensing regime uh, that many other countries do look at, uh, and it does pri provide that framework for frontline police officers and specialized investigators uh, to do their work and to ensure, you know, that they actually uh, have the ability to advance investigations. And just and in that vein, I mean, obviously, one of the gaps that exists is the whole notion of how we think about ghost guns. And within the notion of a classification, obviously, things that are regulated, things that are not regulated, things like barrels, tri slides, trigger assemblies, these are things that are treated very, very differently than firearms themselves. As we think about a path forward, how would you, again, what would be your reflections on the importance of thinking about components, perhaps differently than we have in the past? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, through you, you know, and we continue to do consultations with law enforcement partners, police of jurisdiction, uh, clearly the issue of smuggling, straw purchasing, theft, private manufacturing, i.e. ghost guns, uh, is becoming more predominant in the discussion around sourcing of crime guns. And so, you know, from a policing perspective and the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, Canadian Chiefs of Chiefs of Police, uh, believe that, you know, obviously with the evolution uh, of legislation, there is an opportunity to actually regulate uh, ghost guns, regulate the manufacturing, uh, regulate uh, parts, uh, the importation. Those are opportunities uh, from a policing perspective and a police leadership perspective in partnership with public safety to look at opportunities to actually manage and provide uh, opportunities around enforcement, around licensing, around a, a framework that actually provides that ability. And so, uh, in generally, when you speak, and, and I, I don't speak speak on behalf of all police leaders, but uh, the RCMP, and I can speak on behalf of the CCP as the past president, um, you know, we're interested in engaging governors around regulation of ghost guns, parts, and manufacturing. Thank you. And with the minute that I have, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Duckledup, going to you, similar question. I mean, obviously, you're responsible for the crime prevention branch. Um, as you, as part of your mandate, I imagine looking at what types of crimes you're going to need to prevent going forward is, is probably part of your job. If you think about, again, ghost guns, and in particular how we think about components and, and the production of these types of, uh, these types of these types of weapons that are being used for, for crime, what would you say are the most important things for us to reflect on in this conversation? Thank you for the question. Absolutely, and I would reflect as well on my discussions with my colleagues internationally as well. Ghost gun, if we want to have foresight policy, quite frankly, this is a phenomenon that we're obser observing more and more as problematic. We hear it from police officers, whether the component, whether it's the parts that is, are being used to add to something that is printed, uh, that is not heavy enough, or, or, or any of these uh, areas of concerns that are increasing in the country. I think it is really key for the committee, and you heard a lot of testimonies uh, as we review them as well about the concerns from police, but also from stakeholders about uh, ghost guns and components for sure. Thank you. I think I may be out of time. Turns out I misled you. You have one more minute. Have one more minute. Excellent. Well, that's excellent. Um, 
If we could just, uh, if we just return very, very quickly then to, I'm gonna keep going on this, going on this really, but if we return to the point that you just made about the international sort of element to this, there is a growing concern internationally um, creating forward-looking public policy is key. What are some of the things that you would say, having now talked to your international colleagues, um, that are lacking in Canada that should be part of this conversation going forward? And what are you seeing as best practice in other parts of the world? Obviously, I'm not here to give any uh, <laughs> advice other than what we know. Uh, I could tell you, actually, the report from CQ that you brought forward, there were recommendations, and I always refer to them when I discuss with stakeholders or others to seek their opinion. I believe there were recommendations 29 and 30 of your report that talked exactly to these issues. And quite frankly, I thought they were very well informed and were very well formulated in your recommendations. And this is the work that we continue doing, assessing with international partners or stakeholders domestically on what are their thoughts and how we could address it to inform the advice to the government for sure. Thank you, Mr. Noor Mohammed. On y va maintenant, Madame Michaud. We'll now go to Ms. Michaud for six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to everyone for being here today. It is very much appreciated. As MPs, we get to speak with analysts and legal clerks to help us with our amendments. Sometimes we'll have an idea, and then they'll help us write it down with the proper wording. Sometimes they'll say it's a good idea, but it might go beyond the scope of the bill because there are no clauses in the bill that currently speak of this. And so sometimes it can restrict the direction that we want to go in. So I'm sure that um, in your different departments, such as with the Department of Justice, you have had consultations on the topic of amendments G4 and G46. Now, Mr. Dal Kabab, have ministers from the Department of Justice said that this may be going beyond the scope of the bill? Do, could we use, for example, a motion to broaden the scope of the bill? Is this a comment that you received from the Department of Justice? As you know, I can't speak with you of what has been discussed with lawyers, unfortunately. And so uh, this information must remain confidential. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask some questions to members of the RCMP. Mr. Larkin, thank you for being here. Uh, I know that there was a, a visit that was recently done. I think it would have been useful for us MPs to have done that even earlier on. Now, earlier we were talking about airsoft guns, and it was stated that it's rare that um, we can use an airsoft part in, in order to create a functional gun, that it will likely not work. That being said, what we saw in, on our visit with the RCMP is that this is something that happens very often. And airsoft guns Airsoft gun parts, rather, are very similar to the parts that we find in other firearms. So could we enforce and ensure that manufacturers don't produce airsoft parts that could be compatible with real firearms? because we don't want to prevent people from using airsoft guns, but we're also seeing that these parts are being used in real guns. So Mr. Larkin, is this a tendency that, or a trend rather, that you have witnessed? And what could we do to respond to this problem? Or Ms. Paquette? Yes, it's actually a trend we have seen. Um, what is happening is, we'll just use the AR-15 um, firearms as an example. They're produced um, the same size, 
a lot of the uh, components are the same components as the real firearm. Um, so what we're seeing is these um, airsoft firearms uh, will be replaced with the real uh, firearm parts quite easily. Uh, most recently, I think there was a uh, hundred actually that we saw in BC. So we're seeing an increase of this happening. Et la deuxième partie de ma question. And the second part of my question was, do you have the necessary resources to deal with this, this trend? You know, now we have 3D printers, we have ghost guns, we have airsoft components. And I would like to commend all the efforts of law enforcement and the RCMP, but it seems that we will never be able to keep up with the evolution of technology. Do you think that you have the necessary resources to deal with this? Merci, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question. We have received um, ongoing investment in the Canadian Firearms Program and that uh, we did actually create uh, a new unit under Ms. Paquette's um, Canadian Firearms Program, N-West, uh, which does a fair significant amount of work. Uh, but clearly, as this industry continues to grow, uh, the airsoft industry in different pieces, um, and of course, as those become uh, wise around uh, manufacturing and, and parts exchanges, etc., uh, you know, clearly we would need to look at organizational priorities, organizational mandate, as how we reallocate resources. And so in short, you know, it's something that we're always concerned about. Um, and what are the priorities of our organization and how do we adjust and align? Uh, crime trends do change. Uh, clearly, we're seeing significant uh, change in violent crime in our country. And so hence, as an organization, we're always shifting and looking at where do we reallocate those resources. But, um, you know, the the funding and uh, again the the uh, you know full time equivalents to move into some of this work is a challenge. Uh, the Canadian Firearms Program does excellent work, although continues to face significant challenges in meeting the demands of Canadians. Merci beaucoup. Je pense qu'il reste que quelques. Thank you. I think I only have a couple seconds left, so I think I'm done. Thank you very much, Mr. Julian. Two minutes. Yeah, yes, it does. Please. Thank you, the Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and thank you uh, for, for coming here to offer this, uh, this important advice and answer our questions. I, I think it was uh, uh, very relevant to hear about the loopholes that exist. Uh, it is true that there have been concerns raised about the, the loopholes around manufacturing being deliberately exploited, but I think it was an important point to raise uh, that it is also because of the looseness of the current process around manufacturers, uh, it can be inadvertent as well that they simply misclassify a firearm and bring it onto the market. Uh, in, a, in an honor system uh, accidentally without understanding uh, changes in the law. So I appreciated you clarifying that and, and answering uh, those issues about the existing manufacturer's loopholes. I think that should give food to thought to every member of the committee, uh, that we have these loopholes that can be either consciously exploited or inadvertently used to bring uh, firearms uh, into Canada that uh, are are not appropriate, and uh, I think we'll all reflect on, on those comments. I, I wanted to come back to uh, ghost guns because uh, that is another major concern. I know it's a concern with law enforcement right across the country where I come from in the Lower Mainland. It's been raised. The Biden administration has recently uh, taken action against ghost guns, and the statistics that were cited were 20,000, astounding number of um, untraceable firearms that have been seized as a part of criminal investigations in the past year alone. Uh, would you have available uh, similar numbers for Canada over the past year, uh, the number of, of ghost guns, untraceable weapons that have been used in the commission of criminal offences? Uh, 20,000 I find astounding. And that, that I must uh, mention, Mr. Chair, is a thousand percent increase. Uh, over the last couple of years. So we're talking about a, having a dramatic impact uh, on, on criminals being able to access uh, these untraceable weapons. I can, I can try with trying to play quarterback here. I, I, think, that, I think the challenge that, that we have here is that the criminal regime governing ghost guns 
where you would see uh, offenses, recorded charges, late prosecutions entered would be under manufacturing, under illegal trafficking, and we can't disaggregate the data uh, that we have currently through Statistics Canada to be able to say uh, of those charges, of those offenses, how many involved ghost guns. Certainly, I think you know and your, your committee's study previously that Mr. Dacobub talked about, uh, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, in terms of police seizures with ghost guns, but I, th I think it's very difficult to be able to, to give you that kind of data that you're looking for. Thank you. Uh, because it is not being compiled, I mean, anecdotally, we've seen in certain, uh, with certain uh, law enforcement in certain parts of the country, tenfold increase, 40-fold uh, 40, 40 increase uh, I've heard of in, in one community. Um, how would we be able to get those figures? If they're not being compiled now, um, what are the steps that would be required so that we would have an accurate assessment on the number of these untraceable weapons used in criminal offenses in the way that the United States has? They, they, they have that massive number of 20,000. Um, we, how, how would we get to develop that data if it's not available to us now? Swimming a bit out of my lane, but I'd say, I'd say two things based on gen general knowledge. St Statistics Canada can do special data um, uh, da data projects where they mine where they mine the data that they receive from the from the provinces and territories, from the police forces, from the from the court system. So that's a qualitative data analysis that they would be able to do. An another way to do it, and I know because you've been talking about it a lot, would be. Uh, uh, looking at whether new criminal offenses could be added to the code, for example, which then provides a, that are specific to ghost guns, that provides a, um, a data point to, to measure against because if there's a specific offense, then there's a, a charge entered with respect to that offense and, and Statistics Canada is able to pull that information. So this would be the two ways that I can think of. Okay, and, and very quickly, would the Department of Justice be willing to make that request of StatsCan? We can certainly ask Statistics Canada to see what information is available. And, and that would be helpful, I think, for, for a committee as well. I, I wanted to, don't have a lot of time, but the chair has been very, uh, uh, very flexible. 45 which is seconds. Great. Pardon me? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> 35 seconds, okay. 45. Uh, two, two, two questions. Yeah. First, first off, um, the, the issue of border measures, uh, I, I note the 1,100 seized illegal weapons. Uh, do we have any estimate on the flow of illegal weapons across the border? Because that has been concern, I think, that all, all recognized parties have been raising in the House of Commons. And then secondly, in terms of buyback programs, uh, I would like to know how it is evaluated. Uh, uh, we've certainly heard concerns from, from people in terms of buyback programs being offered uh, much less than the value of their firearm. And, and that seems uh, to me uh, when, in a sense, they're contributing to ensuring that the laws are enforced in Canada, very unfair to those, uh, those, those, uh, those individuals. Maybe I'll start with the last question, Mr. Chair, if you allow me. So throughout our engagements uh, on firearms, uh, as the minister indicated it, we've been also engaging and asking stakeholders in indigenous communities and, and, and gun owners about their feedback on the price list that was uh, provided publicly to, to gather this feedback and to be able to provide an informed advice to the government after. So I just want to reassure you that we are gathering for from any consultation or discussion or engagement that we're doing, not only information about the amendments that were withdrawn, about the bill itself, but also about the buyback program. So we're still in uh, the process of gathering any feedback, and we welcome always the feedback to be able to provide an informed advice to government. As for the border, I, I could turn it to my colleague here who's with us from uh, <coughs> CBSA. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, regarding the patterns and flow of uh, firearms across the border, particularly illicit ones that have been seized, we've definitely seen approximately 1,100 over the past two years, 1,109 two years ago. Uh, notwithstanding the gap in time over the pandemic, where we would have seen an artificial reduction in volumes due to the limited travel, that is still uh, approximately a 40% increase from the pre-pandemic levels. So overall, we are seeing uh, an increase in the flow of illicit firearms, as represented by what we do seize and interdict. Uh, but again, that is a representation of what we know, not 
not necessarily what we do not know. I'm sure that there will be corresponding volumes increasing as the restrictions potentially uh, are ratified within Canada. So domestically, as the availability of firearms that are, uh, are then listed or prohibited or as that evolves, then we'll tend to see probably an increase in traffic cross-border firearms smuggling. As such, you know, we, we do benefit from the range of investments that have uh, been afforded the CBSA in the past couple of years. We are definitely advancing our ability to detect, to interdict firearms through both uh, technical as well as canine, as well as training for, for BSO measures. So we have a variety of different measures that we're hoping will have a greater impact, and I'm, I'm hoping that will continue to reflect and uh, uh, present within the statistics for seizures. So uh, I anticipate that we will continue to see an increase, certainly uh, in uh, relation to potential domestic legislative changes. Uh, but again, we're at the same time the agency is attempting to do its best to position itself in order to uh, to greater uh, prepare itself to interdict firearms or an increase in volume through the variety of different modes where we tend to see them arrive in Canada. Illicitly. Thank you. A very, very ample 45 seconds. <laughs> So, so that wraps up our first round. Um, you've all been very uh, tight with your questions and very succinct, generally, with your answers. Um, so we may well have chan a chance to do a full second round, although I might have to shave a couple of slots at the end. So we'll start the second round with uh, Mr. Motts. Mr. Motts, please go ahead. Five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, witnesses, for being here. Uh, Mr. Larkin, first of all, Brian, thank you for your uh, many years of service. I uh, appreciate your leadership on the CPA. And Mr. Anson, thank you for your military service. Um, greatly appreciated. So, for both of, uh, for, for all of the committee, did, did any did any one of you have a hand in the development of this Bill C-21, or was that from the from the minister and his department specifically? I'm part of the Department of Public Safety that provides the policy advice to the minister for sure. So that that was, that was something that uh, that you may have had a hand in. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, now, again, if I have, if, if I demonstrate any ill will towards C21, it's not directed to you personally. All right, just so you know. Um, now, I, I know that uh, we've had, you know, we've had many people here talk about the impact of C21, or the lack of impact of C21. Now. Did you provide the minister, or did anyone on this committee provide the minister or the, the Ministry of Public Safety with any, getting some feedback here, um, with any uh, documentation or any evidence that the C-21 as proposed was actually going to make a difference, positive difference on public safety in this country? Was there any evidence to support it? I believe I've, I've te testified in this committee in the past speaking about Bill C-21 not only addressing crimes but also addressing gender-based violence and as well mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And it is important to bear in mind from my perspective as a policy wonk, if you wish, is that the bill is really a step among any many other pillars that are important. And, and quite frankly, I do want to refer a little bit to the Mass Casualty Commission report that is asking us to look at what is community safety in Canada is and not only in one pillar, but as a whole. And I do believe that Bill C-21 is one of the steps, but not the full spectrum. Well, I, I would disagree with uh, that assessment, and I can. Um, I don't see, and I've never seen anyone produce any credible evidence that suggests that uh, going after law-abiding uh, Canadian firearm owners will have any positive impact on public safety. We are all, everyone in this committee, uh, all of the country, including their millions of firearm owners are concerned and uh, support the idea of improving public safety. This bill does not do that. And we've had witnesses at this committee who we thought would be very strong on aspects of the bill. They have said quite the opposite. They do not believe it'll have the positive impacts as is planned. Um, one of the things that I found interesting is when we had uh, Dr. Bryant here, who is the Alberta's chief firearm officer, I asked her uh, about the definition of a military-style assault weapon or military assault-style weapon, however terminology that is there, and like I, I'm, I find it astounding that that the, in fact the word I used was ludicrous, and she agreed that there would be this definition or this term used with no definition, and now we're scrambling to try and find a definition for a term that really doesn't. 
exist, you know, and for no firearms that fits it, because the firearms that should fit this bill have already been prohibited in this country since the 70s. And so I asked Dr. Bryant the definition of a, of what could be defined as a military-style assault weapon. And the answer was one that I knew, from my experience, to be a firearm capable of producing a rapid fire with one pull of the trigger with a large capacity magazine. All of those things are prohibited in this country already. So the fact that we're trying to find a definition for a term that already is a prohibited firearm, we're going to try and make it more prohibited. I, I find that actually quite uh, astounding, to be honest with you. And we, we could be spending our time uh, trying to uh, tighten up and fix what, what maybe um, could be fixed or, or made stronger in the Firearms Act and other pieces of legislation. And so I, I find it interesting uh, that, that that's still what we're trying to do. The minister was here and said, we're going to basically ask this committee to come up with a, uh, you know, a, a definition of, uh, of a prohibited, which is really a prohibited firearm. And, um, you know, the only thing that I agree with the, with the minister on is that there should be a separate body designed to classify firearms separate from the RCMP, not the RCMP not involved in it, but a non-political group of individuals with expertise, with the RCMP included, that define firearms and classify those Mr. firearms, Mons, period. That, that's your time. Uh, I don't know if there's anything there you need to respond to or wish to, but uh, if you wish to, uh, please go ahead. Just maybe say just a couple of words, and yes, I met as well personally with the Chief Firearm Officer from Alberta, and she has very strong views. I'm not here to argue uh, her views, but what is important is the intent of the definition was to provide clarity to what kind of guns we don't want in Canada. And this was the intention of having these characteristic defining, a little bit like you were saying, actually, what kind of characteristic of a gun that we will not be accepting in our country, and I think that was the purpose of this uh, definition. We go now to Mr. Gahir. Mr. Gahir, please go ahead. Six minutes. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Dockenbaum and perhaps for Mr. Larkin as well. So during our study, a number of women's organizations noted that red flag laws may place a burden on survivors of domestic violence and that if police organizations were more responsive, these provisions wouldn't actually be needed. So how do we balance the need for uh, police organizations to take the complaints of women more seriously versus the need to provide additional tools to victims and survivors of domestic violence? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if you allow me, I'll start by answering the question. First of all, the red flag provision in Bill C-21 do not remove the responsibility of law enforcement and the police to do what they have to do as it is prescribed right now in the Criminal Code of Canada in the red flags. It is an addition to allow further uh, the, the victims, families, or, or actually Canadians when they feel there's a risk to bring it to the attention of a judge for an assessment. I would say I've been part of uh, the first introduction of Bill C-21 by Minister Blair. I've been part of the second one, and I had discussions as well with uh, stakeholders, and the second bill added some provisions to ensure privacy, to ensure uh, in-camera hearings, as it was uh, uh, criticized in the first time around of Bill C-21. It does not remove the fact that there is work as well to be done, and that is a reason why some of the funding that is provided to law enforcement provinces and territories is to work as well with law enforcement for their time to react or to take seriously when they get these complaints. So I just want to clarify that what I'm saying is this bill adds support, but it's not the only thing that is required. There is more as well to be done through training for law enforcement and clarity on their role and responsibilities. But happy to turn it to my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Larkin, if he wants to add anything. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Um, again, I just want to reiterate, it's unfortunate in, uh, to hear that many groups feel that we're not taking it seriously, and we take that to heart, and that becomes, uh, as my colleague uh, indicated, there is uh, proposed funding to expand awareness, training, and education for law enforcement and frontline policing, because uh, it's critical that we get this right when we look at the challenges of intimate partner violence, and so uh, the feedback is well received, and we're hoping uh, that we'll be able to invest in a greater national program, not just for the RCMP, but for all police services jurisdiction to raise the key awareness and education for the appropriate action to be taken. So thank you. 
Great, thank you. My next question, probably for uh, Mr. Taylor, actually. So I wanted to touch on C5 because the minister touched on C5 in his opening testimony. Now, C5 removed mandatory minimum penalties for groups that are historically disadvantaged, uh, Indigenous Canadians, Black Canadians, groups that are actually overrepresented in our prison populations. Now, if you believe conservative rhetoric on C5, you'd, you'd think that it would increase recidivism. So do you want to comment a little bit about C5, the effect on recidivism, and uh, the intent behind C5? Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I mean, I, I could start by reminding the committee, and I think you know that C5 did re um, repeal a number of MMPs, including for firearms offences, but did not repeal MMPs for firearms offences involving prohibited or restricted firearms or where, where those firearms were, um, offences were connected to organized crime. Um, Minister Lametti, and I think on the Justice Canada website, there's fairly extensive evidence uh, and information um, related to the purpose of C5, which was to address the disproportionate impact that MMPs for some offences had on uh, certain individuals, certain populations overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, the bill itself did not alter the purposes and principles of sentencing, uh, which um, state that sentences must reflect the seriousness of the offence and the responsibility of the offender. So, as Minister Lametti has stated uh, countless times, uh, uh, and, and Minister Mendicino as well, uh, in response to another question, uh, th they have confidence in the justice system imposing appropriate uh, penalties based on the facts before them. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gahir. On y va maintenant, Madame Michaud. We'll now go to Ms. Michaud for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have another question for Mr. Larkin and Ms. Paquette from the RCMP. Could you tell us a little bit more on the role of the RCMP when a firearm is manufactured in Canada and outside of Canada? Are they subject to the same rules? As far as I've understood in our meetings, the RCMP is not automatically notified when a new firearm enters into the market. I'm wondering if we could create a sort of pre-authorization process before the firearm enters onto the market. Now, I don't know what Health Canada's process is, but I can imagine that before a pharmaceutical company puts a new pill onto the market, they would have to ensure that it respects the norms of Health Canada. So I'm wondering if we could do something similar for firearms, that the, web, that the RCMP be notified actually before the firearm is put onto the market instead of what's happening now. So what applies right now for firearms made in Canada and outside of Canada? Uh, thank you, Chair, for the question. Um, so restricted and prohibited firearms, um, the individual or the business uh, must have them verified. And it's linked to the registration certificate. Um, so in this case, there will be a record of that firearm. Where the gap or um, the concern I'm hearing is really around the non-restricted firearms. So individuals or businesses, whether they're external or internal um, to Canada, are not required to verify the <coughs> firearm. Um, and since they're non-restricted, they're not subject to registration. And therefore, there's no record that's required. So... Donc on en comprend que si... So this means that when a firearm enters onto the market, it won't automatically be classified by the RCMP. This will be done later on. And I don't think I have any more time, but if you could answer that question. Yes, that's correct. Merci, Monsieur le Président. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I, uh, you're way ahead of me. Uh, Mr. Julian, if you please, uh, two minutes and a half. C'est pas ce ministère est porté par notre président. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
then come back in my two and a half minutes uh, to uh, three things. First, Mr. Taylor, I understand you made a commitment then to look into how we might actually be able to determine the extent of ghost guns across the country. Thank, thank you for that. Um, um, Mr. Dakobab, I wanted to come back to the issue of the buyback program. I know you, you said, well, we're, we're getting feedback. Uh, but my question was very specific. Uh, uh, how, when you have a buyback program and the value of the firearm is, is, is not met, that, that that person, I'll give you a specific example, uh, may have paid $3,000 for the firearm, uh, has no problem with going the buyback program, but uh, the buyback program is 50% of the value, so $1,500. Um, it seems to me that that is uh, unfair to people, legal gun owners who respect laws and are respecting uh, the component around the buyback program, and yet they are not receiving uh, the price that they've paid. Uh, is that something that the government uh, will will address so that uh, those those people who are willing to go in the buyback program, who are part of the buyback program, are actually getting full value of what they paid for that firearm? Obviously, I cannot speak on behalf of what the government will or will not do. But what I could say is our minister has been vocal on his intent to give fair value for the incentive to, for people to return their guns to the government. Uh, so I, I cannot really tell you what the final value will be or what the minister will do. But I, I could tell you that we are asked to provide sound advice on what the fair value of the guns will be. So it, would it be fair to say that the government has heard that that's a problem uh, and, and is looking to address it? I would say it will be fair to say that we are reflecting when we hear that there is a problem because I, I will say that not every gun on the list of the price that was provided were hearing that there was an issue. Maybe you're hearing otherwise, but there are some people who come with specific guns saying the value of my gun is different. But I cannot speak, and I could ask, uh, it's my colleague who's leading the file now, and I could ask him if he, there is additional info to provide. But I could tell you that what I know is that not every gun on the list is in question. Okay, thank you. And my final question, sorry. Just, just to follow up on Mr. Anson, thank you for your answer. But the question that I'd asked uh, in part was, do we have an estimate of the flow of illegal arms across the border. If we're getting, if we ca have captured 1,100, do we have any sort of estimate of what the, the, the number could be crossing our border every year? Uh, statistically speaking, we can use that as a sample that would re potentially represent an overall increase in what the denominator would, or the, would be in terms of the overall volume. So that is a reflection, presumably, of an increase in volumes, but we cannot necessarily determine what we are not catching at the border necessarily. So uh, I'm sure that some of the statistics might represent and potentially in domestic crime that is a post-border event, but we're not able to speak necessarily to what we are not seeing uh, in terms of interdictions, seizures, uh, you know, through the various modes at the border or through a port of entry, through the postal stream or commercial or otherwise. So uh, it's not a statistic that we necessarily are able to provide. Thank you, Mr. Julian. How time flies. We've, we've got five, five minutes left, so we're going to shave down the last two, two slots to two minutes. Mr. Lloyd, two minutes, if you please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Larkin or, or uh, Ms. Paquette, um, uh, Statistics Canada seems to be getting better at providing some of the data that we need to make informed decisions. There was a recent uh, report on violent crime involving firearms in 2021. And in that study, it was determined that a long gun, a rifle or a shotgun, uh, not automatic, uh, was involved or was present at 0.47% of all violent crimes. Out of that percentage, 0.47%, how many of those would be classified as an assault-style firearm? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we do not track that information, so we'd have to actually go back and do some homework, and uh, we could attempt to respond to that, but we don't have that information available. Presumably, it would be smaller than 0.47%, though. I presume there's a lot of, there are 0.47% of those would involve 
regular shotguns, including even hunting shotguns and rifles uh, that could be used in crimes, but uh, so-called assault-style firearms would represent an even smaller fraction of that 0.47%. Um, a situation has been brought to my attention, potential situation, you know, when people are facing mental health challenges, we know they can recover. Um, and gun owners are no different. Uh, when a fire, legal firearm owner is going through a mental health challenge, um, sometimes they, under the previous rules, would transfer a firearm uh, to a, another loved one or a friend who also had a firearms license. Um, and then when they would get better, uh, they would get that firearm back at a later date. Um, under the handgun freeze that has been implemented, it seems like there could be an unintended consequence in that people uh, who are undergoing mental health challenges would not be able to transfer that firearm to a loved one. Ten uh, would they be able to transfer it to law enforcement and get it back from law enforcement, or is that not even possible? You want to speak to how, if somebody has a mental health case, with the yellow flag, it could be, the PAL could be suspended for a while and brought back so the person could get it back, but it's not different than what right now is happening with red flag or yellow flag. If the police deems that the person should not be having their firearm, regardless if it's handgun or not, they could revoke, well, <laughs> the firearm uh, could be, the pile could be revoked, and then once they're be better, they could get it back. So is that right? You could correct me if I'm wrong, please go ahead. Yes, you're correct. But also, um, if the individual is going through a crisis and they recognize that they would like temporary storage somewhere, the friend, or they can work through their their chief firearms officer to do that. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. You wouldn't be permanently. Madame de Maff, s'il vous plaît. Two. Ms. de Maff, two minutes. Thanks, Chair. Um, I wondered if someone could go through how the red flag provision in the bill, as it's currently written, would work. We know that the doctors are very supportive of, of, of the amendment, but as has already been discussed, women's organizations are not. So I'm in a situation where my partner is a police officer. I'm worried about going to the police because the um, they may not want to respond, or I just, in my own mind, feel that isn't an avenue to to go. So what is what is in this bill and how will it work? If you allow me, I'll, I'll start and then my colleague, uh, Mr. Taylor, if he wants to add something. So what is proposed in the bill is anybody, let's say the doctor in your example, uh, will uh, request that removal through the red flag of these firearms of the individual. They go to the court and just to emphasize as well, the government announced that there will be as well some uh, a program, uh, so financial support for organizations to be able to access the program once there is royal assent will be put in place, uh, funding to allow as well NGOs to be able to support uh, uh, victims or, uh, or, or to support in the process for the court. And then, yes? An organization like Halton Women's Place in my riding would be able to access financial support to guide a woman through that process. Is that what you're saying? There was an announcement done that there will be funding for this program. The program details have not been finalized because we need to get royal assent first, and then we'll work through our Treasury Board colleagues to establish the terms and conditions. But yes, you are correct. The intent of the program is to provide NGOs with support to be able to, uh, to help victims because we understand that sometimes victims in the crisis mode, it's harder for them to start getting through court and police and all these issues. So I only have 30 seconds left, and, and so that was helpful. So I'm able to go to Halton Women's Place, and, and they're able to go to court for me. The concern that I've heard from women's organizations is if you put this in place, the police are going to stop responding. So um, I, I guess it would be directed to the RCMP, but that is the concern we've heard. The police are going to say you have the opportunity to go to court. So how can we ensure that that does not happen? Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the, the obligation and the duty, fiduciary duty of policing would once again still remain within the criminal code and in the process. And so uh, we recognize those concerns. We've heard them loud and clear. Uh, hence, um, an opportunity to enhance national uh, education and training of frontline police officers. Uh, but in short, the fiduciary duty of a police officer would be to actually take action um, and not actually suggest the alternative method. The alternative method is a safe gap for 
for somebody that may have a concern whether police will take action or not or provide that opportunity you just don't feel comfortable and so it would not actually remove the fiduciary duty uh, of law enforcement in that case thank you mr muff and thank you all to our to all of our officials today and uh, i know you had some uh, you had a long day and uh, you've given us some excellent information, and uh, and I appreciate your service. And uh, with that, we are. Uh, I'll just mention that for the committee subcommittee on Friday, and the point of that is we want to get kind of squared away in an abundance of ambition for what happens after C21. So, so um, thank you all, and uh, we're now adjourned. Perfect.